technology right. We look at the verses today. I'm going to ask you to do something for this Resurrection Sunday before we start into the, the word that's vital. And um, I'm going to pray for you, over you, but let's think about what we're praying for. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for the purposes of your own ability to focus not to make anything hidden, but just to, just to focus. And just, if you'll just think about these questions before we go to the Word. Do you in any way sense at this point, this day, that this is dull? The truth of Jesus' death, resurrection has become dull to you. Do you in any way sense that, yes, that's a historical event, and yes, I've already taken care of that. This is just a pit stop for the rest of my month. Do you sense a, I don't know, a, almost a blasé deadness to the things of God? <coughs> You have thousands of other things running through your head. You have so many other places you need to be and would rather be than in a place to worship. And has the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus become just a habit? Well, then receive this as I pray over you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. Holy Spirit, you have promised. The Father has promised that you, Holy Spirit, will be in a special way when two or three gather together in your name. Revive us, O oh God. Renew us. And for some, Father, recreate us. Give us intense focus, Lord. Give us intense ability to hear with our ears of our spirit and to be able to hear, Lord, what your word says, regardless of what I preach, Father, regardless of how I mess it up or get it right. I ask your Holy Spirit, Lord, to be among us. And Father, in any way, Father, in any way that you call us to action, you call us to adjust, to change, or even to the extent of just surrendering ourselves at your cross, knowing that the resurrection has occurred. We ask you for this. Because the alternatives are bad. To be lost and undone at the day of judgment is bad. To be lukewarm is to be spewed out of the Father's mouth. Both are bad. Father, we ask. And please have mercy on us. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'll be reading several verses, but last week we left off with these thoughts about Jesus. There is only, how many ways? There is one way. This is so foreign to our pluralistic world. This one concept places Jesus in a whole different place. He stands alone as the only way to the Father. And most of us can mentally agree with that. But when it becomes practically, we struggle. Today on Resurrection Sunday, I hope to share with you the gospel. Through who Jesus was, what he said in his last days before the cross, the effect he had after the resurrection, the reality of his resurrection. And the first scriptural reference is going to be in John 20, verse 30 and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, 
which are not written in this book. There's a lot that's not written in this Bible. But these have been written so that, why have they been written? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Let's understand what salvation is and what salvation is not. Salvation is not a moment of walking to an altar, repeating a prayer after a man, and then living your life. Let me read that last line again. And that believing you may live, you may have life in whose name? His name. Listen, there's a lie out there that says, I already took care of that. There's a lie out there that says that Somebody might be 70, 80 years old, lived like a, a hellion for 70 of those years, and we asked the question at a funeral, but did he, did he say that prayer at 10 years old? If I die at 70 years old, if I die at 54 years old, and you don't know I'm a Christian, i tell you where I'm headed. It'd be hell. If there's no more testimony of my salvation than the fact that I walked some altar at eight years old and lived like hell for the next 40 years. You can guarantee that the fruit says that ain't no fruit tree that came from Jesus. Because when Jesus saves somebody, what does He do? He changes them. And it's a slow process, I tell you. Like that song said, He comes running after us. It's a reckless love. He gets us when we when need to be sanctified. He gets us when we're lost and saves us. But even when we're saved, He goes and grabs us out of the, the mire. He gets us out of the muck. He drags us back and He cleans us up and He puts us back astray and we go astray again. Then He goes and gets us. You can't live 60 years. You can't live 60 years on hell's side of it and claim to be a Christian. You can't. It's unbiblical. Our Father's not like that. Our Lord comes and gets us. He loves us that much. Understand that when He was on this earth, there was proof. Listen, it ain't a historical figure. Yeah, it's written in the Bible. There is history to it. I'm telling you, Jesus is real. At that time, before the cross... He healed hundreds of people, maybe thousands. The miracles were crazy good. Feeding 10,000, 5,000, feeding people, walking on water. He raised the dead more than once. It wasn't just Lazarus. He raised the dead on multiple occasions. It's crazy how good it was. He lived a sinless life. He stood glorified on this earth with Moses and Elijah. And then after the resurrection, what have we got? Yes, we have an empty tomb. Yes, He was shown to Mary Magdalene. He showed Himself to His disciples. He walked through walls, not once, but twice, maybe even more. There were over 500 witnesses. 500 witnesses. And then on the 40th day, after His resurrection, He ascended. Have you ever seen someone who was dead crucified cruelly at the hands of man, crushed on a cross, no more breath, in a tomb, three days, come alive, ask you to put your fingers where the marks were, eat and drink and live with you for 40 days, and then ascend in the clouds. Acts 1.3 to these apostles, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. You need to have Bible when you preach something like 40 days, don't you? It needs to be biblically based, and there it is. Jesus then also promises his Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. It quotes what he said in the Gospels. They ask, what do the apostles ask about? At this point, they ask about, well, what's going to happen when? We want to understand all that John's going to write in Revelation. Can you tell us all about Ezekiel? Can you tell us who's going to be in charge? Because we all like to be kings. And Jesus says, listen. 
I died. I rose. I've talked to you 40 days. You still don't get it to you. It's not for you to know the times or epochs. And then in verse 8, he says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. What was the focus? There is a walk with Jesus. You will have dry times. There will be ups and downs. But if you can't remember the last up, if you can't remember the last time that Jesus meant anything to you, if it goes all the way back to a little heart tug at eight years old and there's nothing since then, you need to consider that possibly that heart tug was only that. Not a born again experience. Jesus was real. He is real. All that the Bible says is true. He was and is the only way. The only way for sin to be dealt with through a perfect, unblemished, unspotted sacrifice. Blood had to be shed. Jesus was the only one to make the propitiation for our sins. He and He alone. Propitiation means to take the place of the guilty party to pay the price in full. And my price was great. The sacrifice was the body that Jesus lived in. And for this purpose, he was born. As a man, he came to die. He came to give his life as the ransom owed for our sin. So how deep does that sin go? Remember the Passover meal? Visualize it in your head. They're all there gathered. Jesus asked this question. He says this statement. One of you will betray me. Well, he, he dipped the bread. He, he gave it to Judas. John was told that, and yet in their minds they said what? Who's he, who's he talking about? Let me tell you why they said who's he talking about. I, I, maybe I'm going off on this. But I wonder how many of them had the same thought. How many of the rest of them thought, wait a minute, where's this ship going? I mean... We're following Messiah, right? <laughs> what you talking about? Dying. How many of them went through his mind? Well, why don't we just go take over Jerusalem now? I mean, we got a guy that can ascend, walk on water, heal. If we get hurt and battle, we'll just all get healed. Maybe some of them thought that. Praise God they didn't fall to that thought. But I'm telling you, the depths of sin... Jesus is reminding them that, yes, yes, it's Judas. Yes, Judas never believed. Yes, Jesus, Jesus knew Judas' heart. He was not going to believe. Judas was going to betray. Before we think too bad about Judas, understand how often have we betrayed the Lord in our lives? How often have we turned our love to other objects other than Christ. How about a second one? Peter proclaimed, I will never deny you. <laughs> Anybody been there? I'll, I'll never let you down, Lord. But yet he would, and yet he did, and how often have we denied him? What is the number of times we have left the battle to hide by the fire with the crowd. Get that picture. They're, 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 they're whooping Jesus. And the apostles are, are scared. And Peter has a choice. Step up to the plate. Possibly lose your life or be crucified next to him. Go stand by the fire. Warm your hands. Before we let ourselves off, 
How many times have we been called to share the reason for the hope that we have? How many times have we slipped over to the fire? Didn't think we'd talk about these sins, did you? How about those cruel soldiers who beat Jesus, their vileness and, and, and savagery, and surely we cannot be compared to them Has, has anger and hatred lived long in our breast? Have we held bitterness and unforgiveness in our hearts? We may not have struck the Savior's back 2,000 years ago, but our hatred lies at the cross in need of a pavement. And then Barabbas... Oh, how ungrateful, how unknowingly of all that he had been set free from. His rebellion and sin was pardoned on the back of our Savior. Do not we stand condemned of not realizing the great price paid on our behalf? For all the penalty due, our beloved willingly took the cup. Jesus willingly bowed his head and yielded on the cross. He in that moment because became sin for us. Don't get that part of the gospel wrong. He became all the evil and wicked thoughts, intentions and actions that we call sin. All the lust-filled thoughts, all the hate filled actions, all the evil that makes up sin. And in that moment, the Father poured out the cup of His wrath. Don't miss this. Do our sin. And our beloved drank it down. And He took every drop. The Father turned His back upon this scene. The Father turned away as His Son became sin and bore the penalty for us. But until we understand that we could have been Barabbas, that we are Peter in denial, and that we are the one that betrays Him, we don't get it. The cross has so little meaning because we have such a high opinion of ourselves. People going around saying, I need to talk about something about me. I need to talk about me. I need to talk about me. What other time in history has every, every man that we know on this planet created their own website with their own worship station to themselves? Everybody has a Facebook. Let me tell you what I did today so that you can comment and make me feel better. Listen. That sin, when he drank every drop, that sin was conquered. The sacrifice was and is accepted. How do I know? The grave is empty. Let me say it one more time. I know that my sin is paid for not because a Jewish person was crucified. That does not finish the story. Do you understand? There were a lot of people who died. Peter could not die for you and me. John the Baptist's death did not save us. Prayers to any saint will not amount to much. The fact that the Holy Spirit went in and raised Christ from the dead because death could not hold down the perfect, sinless, spotless Son of God. And He had become sin. Sin had been condemned and wrath poured out. It was then taken and gates of hell are broken open. And at the altar of God, His blood is poured out as the atoning sacrifice for us. Amen. 
And then the tomb is empty. Isn't that good news? If that doesn't get your fire burning, your fire is very wet. Jesus took our place. And He took our place to call sin, sin, and to condemn sin and sinful man for all eternity and to pay a price that we cannot pay so that He could then be victorious in in a salvation through a resurrection on this day that we celebrate. What can that mean? Jesus took our place. He, we deserve the, gu- the judgment. We deserve the wrath. But instead, Jesus came and took our place. And now we are free. We are not free because of a mental ascension. We are not free because we live in a Christian nation. We are not free because our mama loves God. We are free. Because our lives are born again by faith in Jesus Christ. Through grace, lest any man should boast, we turn it all to Him and we say, God, I know I am a sinner. I know I came up short. And I am only able to trust in the Jesus of Nazareth who was born into mankind as a baby through the Holy Spirit to a virgin named Mary. He lived and proved He was God. As man, he went to the cross, and three days later, he came back to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. He showed himself for how many days? Forty days. He ascended into heaven, and ten days later, he sent his what? He sent his Holy Spirit on Pentecost to dwell in us. He is alive. He is alive, and we are alive because he is alive. And what do we do? John sixteen twenty seven. What do we do now? How do we tell a lost and dying world that Jesus is alive? That even matters to them. I found a tidbit and I hope it helps you and I hope it helps us as a church because I know just like that song, God has been recklessly hitting me over the head with this. And I'm sharing this with you. John 16, 27. For the Father Himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. He first loved us. He reached out and called his disciples. But they did respond. They loved the Father's Son, Jesus. And they did believe. Look, it's not for God so loved the world so therefore everyone is saved. It's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe. There is no universalism. There's no second generation Christians. We all have to go to the cross ourselves. Do we believe? Look at John 17 if you will. And I encourage you to read the whole chapter as one of the last things Christ taught his disciples prior to the cross. But I want to bring one point home about this in application, which I alluded to a moment ago, beginning at verse 13. And this will be the the verses that I think applies this very fully from the resurrection now and moving forward. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. There is so much being said here. There is so much being said. This this is a month of sermons in these verses. 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So that's us. We're going in the world. If we believe in Christ, if he is our Lord and Savior, we are being sent. Verse 19, for their sakes... I sanctify myself. Jesus sanctified himself for you and me. 
that they themselves also may be sanctified. That's where I also know that there's going to be a change. He said he would sanctify us in truth, period. If you are not being sanctified in truth, you are none of his. Do you understand that? If you are miserable running from God, turn back to him. But if you have never experienced the Father's hand disciplining you and sanctifying you and pulling you back, you are none of his. You are illegitimate. You are, you are tares among wheat. For their sakes I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. And this is where the good stuff goes for us to reach out to the world. But for those also who believe in me through their word. We have a, a goal, a, a purpose, a leading to share this wonderful resurrection with the world. That they may all, here it is, that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. How is the world, this is the tidbit, get ready for it, don't miss it, it's coming. How is the world going to know that God sent Jesus? They're going to pick up a Bible? Read it on the news. Catch the latest TV program? How about a new edition of Roseanne? It's come out, it's popular. They're going to know when Christians are unified in the same love that the Father had with the Son. I can't imagine that. I am not there. I see my bride being a servant to others. And I see her being a helpmate to me when physically it's hard to go out and lay tile. When physically she's already worked all day. I see the way she loves me. I don't know that I'm giving that back as I should. I see the way my two sons watch out for me as I trip a little more often. I see love like I don't understand. I see two little kids come by the bottom of my window in the mornings and I'm, they're screaming, Grandpa, and I'm saying, and I love you. But I still don't get that look. The way they love me is just beyond what I can understand. My parents are crazy in the way they love me. Do you have people like that in your life that you don't know why? They love you Yesterday, my wife's family loved me. And I was irritable. And I told them I was sorry, and they immediately, they immediately said, you ain't going to apologize for, we love you. Listen, that's just an inkling. Let's read verse 22, because it comes up again. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Our unity is important. I, how are you one? Listen to it. I in them... You, talking about the Father, in me, talking about Jesus, that they may be perfected in unity. And here it comes again. This is how the world knows. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. If there's not love going on between us, why would the world ever believe that the love of the Father was shed abroad in our hearts? Verse 24, he, he keeps going. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you love me before the foundation of the world. Jesus longs for the day that he takes us into his glory. That's a, going to be a good day. But he shows us glimpses of it here. 25, O oh, righteous Father, Although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And look at 26. He does it again. And I have made your name known to them. And will make it known. So that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Imagine all the people in your life that have shown you love. 
it's no comparison really. It's, it's, it's about as close as I can get on a human level. But the victory of the resurrection, the fact that you and I were guilty and, and, and dead to right, they had us. I mean, there was no reason to let me out. And Jesus said, I will take his place. That's love. You mean even for that, which I don't even tell Walton Bo. Even for those things that I don't even mention to my wife. You mean you took the penalty for that? Yes, I did, he said. And that's love. And that's the kind of love that if we can start to get a glimpse of that more and more, and we do. We had five families up on a mountain at 7 a.m. watching the sunrise. I mean, we do care about each other. But the more we care and the more we buy in to the love of Christ in the name of Jesus poured out through us to one another, and the world sees that, the world will then see Jesus. You have to share the word. They have to know it's not just some cult there you're <laughs> trying to get off here and do something crazy, but that you actually love one another. Now we are to be unified and love in such a way that the world will be one for Christ. Allow the Holy Spirit to do a deeper work in you during these two songs. We're going to play one and we're going to put Come to the Table up top. Carl, if you'll come up here, we'll do one of the songs we have. Then we'll do Come to the Table. And during both of those, listen, listen, the Holy Spirit focused you in. The Holy Spirit. Look, it's not, I, I can't do it as a human. I fall asleep in movies. I go to a movie sometime take a nap. If I'm not sleeping good, I put a movie there, I go out. Okay? Praise God. But you get your mind going on so many things. Well, the better than the movie putting me to sleep to give me a good night's rest is the Holy Spirit focusing you to hear His Word. And somewhere, listen to me, before we sing this song, somewhere in that 30 or 35 minutes, Somewhere in what Bo was saying. Somewhere in the songs earlier. Somewhere in what Walt was praying. Somewhere. The Holy Spirit was recklessly talking to you. You know He was. And He's brought something to mind. If He didn't, He wouldn't be a good Father. He's promised to sanctify us holy. And so my request to you whether in your seat, at this altar, with a brother or sister, somehow, some way, today, obey what the Father, through the Spirit, has said to you. You have two songs to help you focus and listen and worship. But I beg you, do not let this day go by. Let's go to the next one. Let the Lord speak to your heart and you respond in the name of Jesus.